stranger in the valley of the kings. The identification of Yuya as the patriarch Joseph by Ahmed Osman. Chapter 1, The Tomb of Yuya. The tomb of Yuya and his wife Tuya was found in 1905, three years after Theodore M. Davis had obtained a concession to excavate in Biban al Mulak, the Valley of the Kings, at Western Thebes. Davis, who took to spending the winters of his old age at Luxor in Upper Egypt, provided the money. Now, the actual work was carried out by archaeologists, officials of the service of antiquities, such as Howard Carter, James Quibell, Arthur Weigel, and Edward Art Arton, all of whom were British and had been trained by Flinders Petrie, the first Englishman to dig in Egypt, whose works there over the next 42 years was to make him a giant of modern archaeology. In the Valley of the Kings, there is a narrow side valley about a half a mile long leading up to the mountain. In its mouth, at its mouth, the tombs of a prince of Ramesses the three and Ramesses the eleventh have been found er, found excuse me in its mouth the tombs of Prince of Ramesses the th the third and uh, Prince Ramesses the eleventh have been found earlier dug into the side of a foothill about sixty feet high. Now, in 1902, Howard Carter, who was then the Inspector General of the Antiquities of Upper Egypt and in charge of the new excavations, began to explore this valley, starting from the tomb of Ramesses XI and working towards the mountain. The exploration proved rewarding in the following year, 1903, when, when Carter discovered the tomb of Tutmosis the fourth, the father of Amenhotep the third. Now, who ruled circa fourteen o five to thirteen sixty seven B.C. By the way, during the same twelve months, it led to the unearthing of the tomb of another figure from the eighteenth dynasty, Queen Hatshepsut, who reigned from about fourteen ninety to 1486 BC. Now, after that, however, the trail went cold. Now, eight days before the Christmas of 1904, Quibell replaced Carter to continue the examination of the side valley. The flanks of the hills were scraped over by the workmen until the loose upper surface of chips natural and artificial had been removed and the rock had been bare, was bared. A month later, Davis arrived on the scene to learn that all this work had yielded nothing. He therefore decided, following Quibell's advice, to abandon the site and transfer the men back to the mouth of the side valley. Even if this, too, appeared to be an area that was unlikely to yield any further discoveries. Now, Davis records records in his book, The Tomb of Uya and Tuya, or Uya and Tuya, published in 1907. The site was most unpromising, lying as it did between the Ramesses tombs, uh, um, Ramesses III and Ramesses the Eleventh, which had required so many men for so many years. Therefore, it did not seem possible that a tomb could have existed in so narrow a space without being discovered. As an original proposition, I would have not
explored it. And certainly no Egyptologist exploring with another person's money would have thought of risking the time and expense. But I knew every yard of the lateral valley except the space described. And I decided that good exploration justified his investigation and that it would be a satisfaction to know the entire valley, even if it yielded nothing. Back at the mouth of the valley, the workmen started cutting away at the huge bank of chippings, about 30 feet high, that lay on the side of the hill between two Ramesses tombs. After 10 days, they struck the first indication of a third tomb in the shape of a well-cut stone step that promised to prove the first of a flight descending to a tomb passage. Now, by February the 11th, they had exposed the top of a sealed door protruding from the fillings of limestone and sand that blocked the stairway. At this time, Cobell had to leave the site, and Arthur Wigal took his place. Within 24 hours, the door, which was cut in solid rock, had been entirely cleared. However, a section measuring 12 inches by 4 inches near the top of the doorway had been filled in with Nile mud plaster, an indication that the tomb had been broken into at an earlier date by a robber. Wagao's team decided to follow his example. They broke through the seal at the top of the doorway in order to obtain a glimpse of what lay inside. All they could see in the darkness was a steeply sloping corridor about five feet wide. What lay beyond it? That The aperture left by the broken seal was too narrow to accommodate an adult. So they enlisted the services of a small Egyptian boy and lowered him down through the tiny opening. The boy brought out some small objects that... He had found lying on the floor a few feet from the doorway, a gold-covered yoke from a chariot, a wooden staff of office, and a scarab, the sacred beetle, that at first glance appeared to be solid gold, but on close examination proved to be a stone covered with a type of gold foil. Wegal and Davis rejoined at the entrance of the tomb. The next morning by Gaston Maspero, the director and general of the Cairo Museum. After workers had taken down the door, the three men carrying, each carrying a candle entered. They made their way down the steep corridor to find a second door. Now at the top of it had, it was an opening similar to the the one that they had at first, and it was covered from top to bottom with the stamps of a necropolis seal. By the foot of the door lay two pottery bowls in which the ancient workmen had mixed in the final coat of plaster to close the tomb securely. Maspero and Davis used their bare hands to remove some of the stones from the top of the wall and peered through the hole. In the darkness, they could see shining gold coverings, some kind of furniture, and they were unable to that they were unable to identify. Impatient, they managed to scramble through the top of the second door without waiting for workmen to take it down. Then descended into the darkness of the sepulchral chamber. The first thing. Naturally, they wanted to do or know was the name of the owner of the tomb. We held our candles, but they gave so little light and so dazzled our eyes that we could see nothing but the glitter of gold. Davis recalled a few pages further on his book. In a moment or two, however, I made out a very large funeral sled 
which was used to contain all the coffins of the dead person and his mummy and to convey them to his tomb. It was about six feet high and eight long, made of wood covered with bitumen, which was as bright as the day it was put on. Around the upper part of the coffin was a strip of gold foil, about six inches wide, covered with hieroglyphics. On my calling, Monsieur, my sparrow, attention to it. He immediately handled me, handed me the candle, which together with my own, I held before my eyes close to the inscription so that he could read them. In an instant, he said, Ooh, yeah. Naturally excited by the announcement and blinded by the glare of the candles, I involuntarily advanced them near the coffin, whereupon Monsieur Maspero cried out, Be careful, and pulled my hands back. In a moment, we realized that had my candles touched the bitumen, which I came dangerously near to doing, the coffin would have been in a blaze. Davis, Davis's generous decision to continue exploring the unpromising site between the two Ramesses tombs at the mouth of the valley produced a rich treasure trove of Egyptian antiquities. When electric light was introduced into the tomb, it could be seen that it contained also the sarcophagus of Yuya's wife, Tuya. The relics recovered included Yuya's wooden sarcophagus covered with black pitch and bearing lines of inscriptions on a sled. Yuya's mummy inside three coffins like that of Tutankhamun. Two years wooden sarcophagus on a sled, a sledge with text mentioning her son Anin, second prophet of the god Amun Ra. Two coffins, including two years mummy, two gilt masks, one for each of the tomb occupants. This was the mask placed immediately over the head of the mummy. Two Canopic boxes, each divided into four compartments, in which the four canopic vases containing the viscera of the dead were placed. Many ush apti in wooden boxes. Yuya's staff and whip handle. The handle of Tuya's sistrum, a jingling instrument or rattle used especially in the rites of Isis, wife of Osiris, the god of the dead, and also in the worship of Aten, god of the new religion, at Amana, alabaster vases, dummy wooden vases, a wooden statue with the text from the book of the dead, a justification of the dead person's life, which, among others, other things included spells to help him on his journey through the underworld. Three beautiful wooden chairs of different sizes belonging to Sitamon. A jewel box of Amenhotep III. Two beds. A chest belonging to Amenhotep III and his queen Tai. Or queen T. An alabaster va vase belonging to the king and queen. A cool tool or coal tool. Two was a form of makeup, which was the name of Amenhotep III inscribed on it. Pottery. Clay ceilings thought to have the name of Ramesses III attached to linen. Yuya's necklace of large golden beads and lapis luzili. Toilet articles of various types, a plentiful supply of mummified meats, 
again, meant to support the dead person on his or her journey through the underworld. A papyrus wig basket and a wig, probably of human hair. Pairs of sandals in two different sizes, varying in length from 18 to 30 centimeters. A papyrus 22 yards long containing chapters of the Book of, De of the Dead. A chariot in perfect condition, which was at the time on the only second the only the second chariot known to have survived from ancient Egypt. Until the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun 17 years later, the tomb of Yuya was the only one to be found almost intact in Egypt. The two mummies were lying in their coffins. Originally, Yuya's mummy had been enclosed in three coffins in two years in two. But whoever had broken into the tomb earlier had evidently taken the inner coffins and removed their lids, looking for the gold ornaments and jewels. He had scratched the mummy's cloth, stiff and hard from the unguents that had originally been poured over it and had then dried with his nails leaving a great quantity of small bits of cloth in both coffins. When Yuya's body was lifted, the necklace of large beads made of gold and lapis lazuli and strung on a strong thread, which had apparently been broken during the scratching of the mummy's cloth, was found behind the mummy's neck. The tomb robber had also overlooked a gold plate about the size of the palm of a man's hand that had been inserted by the embalmer to conceal the incision he had made in extracting Yuya's heart for special mummification. Both mummies were so well preserved that it seemed to off the Wagao as if there they might open their eyes and speak. The official opening of the tomb took place on February 13th, 1905, attended by the king of England's brother, the Duke of Connaught and his duchess, who had happened to be visiting Egypt at the time. Removing, cataloging, and packing the objects from the tomb, which was supervised by Quebel, took three weeks. Despite all the care taken, some of the packers managed to steal objects from the tomb, but all are believed to have been removed through buying them back from dealers. Now, on March the 3rd, 120 workers started to carry the packing cases down to the river where they were left overnight before being loaded into a guarded train bound for Cairo and Yuya's present resting place in the Egyptian Capitals Museum. Although the tomb of Yuya and Tuya was the most complete one to be found before that of Tutankhamun, nobody thought that Yuya personally was of any great importance. Davis wrote his account of the discovery with an introduction by Mesparo in 1907. Neville published his study of the Yuya's Book of the Dead a year later. Nothing much has been done since other than some studies of different pieces of funerary furniture and its texts. Yet, in the case of Yuya, there are enough curious facets to make it surprising that his origins were not the subject of more detailed investigation, either at the time or in intervening 80 or in the intervening 80 years. As we have already seen, this is the only person we know of from the time of the hits, the hit coast kings onward. To bear the title It Neta Nabatawa, the Holy Father of the Two Lands, which is what Pharaoh would do, would be known as. The same title claimed by Joseph. And although not apparently of royal blood, he was buried in the Valley of the Kings rather than in the Valley of the Nobles 
close to the village of Sheikh Abdel Korna. Furthermore, unlike the tombs of the other nobles, Yuya was neither decorated nor inscribed. His name found on his sarcophagus, the three coffins and other pieces of funerary furniture is not Egyptian and had not been discovered in Egypt before that time. Unlike the ears of most royal mummies of the New Kingdom, Yuya's was not pierced and the position of his hands and palms facing his neck under the chin is different from the usual Osiris form in which the dead man's hands are crossed over his chest. Yuya, as far as is known, is the only Egyptian mummy to have been found with his hands in this position. Yuya bore more, Yuya bore an impressive list of titles in addition to the Holy Father of the Lord of the Two Lands. Father of the God or Holy Father, this was a common priestly title which might be said to correspond to the father of the Roman Catholic Church in the High Church of England or the Padre of the Armed Forces. Master of the Horse, Deputy of His Majesties in the Chariotry, Bearer of the Ring of the King of Lower Egypt, Seal Bearer of the King of Lower Egypt, Hereditary Noble and Count, Overseer of the Cattle, of men, Lord of Akim, overseer of the cattle of Amun, favorite of the God, of the good God Pharaoh, confident, confident of the king, confident, confident of the, confident of the God, the good God, sorry, mouth of the king of Upper Egypt, ears of the king of Lower Egypt. Prophet of the God, men, soul friend, unique friend, first of the friends, prince, great prince, great of love, plentiful of, fla of favors in the house of the king, plentiful of favors under his Lord, enduring of love under his Lord, beloved of the king of upper Egypt, beloved of the king of lower Egypt. Beloved of the Lord of the two lands, beloved of God, professor of favor under the Lord of the two lands, praised of the good God, praised of his God, praised of his Lord, praised of his Lord Amun, praised of the king, praised of the Lord of the two lands, praised one who came forth from the body praised. One made rich by the king of the lower Egypt. One made great by the king of the lower Egypt. One made great by the Lord who does things. First among the king's companions, the wise one. He whom the king made great and wise, whom the king has made his double. Unlike his wife, Tuya, who had conventional Egyptian looks, Yuya was remarkably foreign in appearance. As author Weigel recorded in his book, The Life and Times of Akhenaten, published in 1910, he was a person of commanding presence whose powerful character showed itself in his face. One must picture him now as a tall man with a fine shock of, of white hair, a great hooked nose like that of a Syrian, full strong lips and a prominent determined jaw. He has the face of an ecclesiastic and there is something about his mouth which reminds one of the late Pope Leo the eight, uh, the 13th. One feels on looking at him, well preserved, his well-preserved features that there may be found the originator of the great religious movement which his daughter and grandson carried into execution. There was a reference to T, the daughter of Yuya and Tuya, whom Amenhotep III made his great wife, and their son Amenhotep the, the fourth, Akhenaten, 
who was to close the temples, destroy the gods of Egypt, and establish in their place a monotheistic god like the god of Israel. All right. This brings us to an end of chapter one. When we come back, we will be on chapter two, which is entitled Voices from the Past. Hey, thank y'all for coming out. God bless y'all. Good night. Please don't hesitate to, to like, comment, and subscribe. And remember that your feedback is greatly appreciated. Thank you.